Well, welcome to this Hackspo track. Uh, two days of very cool, high-level technical talks. Uh, as crowd fans, we usually do these kind of things. We sponsor free tracks uh, at Hack in the Box conferences or in other events all over the world as a way to give back to the community of researchers that we're working with and also to, you know, spread the the love <laughs> to anyone who is interested into this kind of stuff. Um, today, I should speak for 45 minutes, but uh, honestly, I don't want to, to bore you to death. So there are much more interesting talks after my introduction. So I'll be brief. Uh, we'll finish earlier and, I, and then I, let this, I will... Uh, give the stage to uh, better speakers than me. So, um, let me briefly introduce myself. I'm a old guy, definitely the older guy in this room. <laughs> and uh, I worked in defensive and offensive security in the past 25 years, both in Italy, where I am originally from Italy and abroad around the world. And I did a few funny things like uh, writing Italy's national security strategy or uh, Italian cybersecurity framework and, and many more documents, best practices and so on until I had this idea of creating CrowdFence four years ago. Uh, CrowdFence is a new way of dealing with a thorny issue which is how do we provide governments with zero days for law enforcement and intelligence purposes behaving in a more or less transparent and ethical way, considering that this market is totally dark and historically developed from the bottom up. So it's lawless, it's rough, and it's also very inefficient because of these reasons. Um, so how can we transform a shady gray area into a proper normal business? This was the, the issue that I wanted to tackle when I decided to find CrowdFence. So <clears throat> as I said, this, the zero day market today, because of many historical reasons, is unsafe for researchers, is chaotic, it's very inefficient from a business point of view. When you need something, you don't find it. When you find it, nobody needs it, and so on and so on. It's terrible. Also considering that the shelf life of these products is on average three, four months, and then they are patched. So you're dealing with very perishable goods, and therefore speed and efficiency are essential. And since this now is a strategic market, we needed to address these, these issues in some business, normal business ways as much as possible, right? Also, the fact that this is a shady market implies that researchers are underpaid and mistreated and ripped off all the time. Because, of course, those who are buying, especially if they are buying big money, they have a disproportionate amount of power compared to the researchers, which is wrong because on, in, in reality, <clears throat> without the researchers, there would be no zero-day market. Okay. And, and what happens then is that these brilliant people, boys and girls, they will test this market, they will be disappointed, they will be scammed, they will be ripped off, and most of the times they, they will leave this market. And then perhaps end up working for SpaceX, which in my opinion is a very good thing, but they would leave the zero-day uh, research environment, which is bad. Therefore, we're also trying to uh, found researchers through uh, scholarships and other ways of paying 
uh, for their research, even when they are not delivering something specif specific. And, um, and in the future, we might create some kind of school so that we can work with uh, younger people and train them and teach them. Also trying to give them the right mindset, because when you're working for national security entities, you cannot get drunk and smoke joints all day, uh, which is fun in itself, but a certain kind of mindset is required, right? <clears throat> so what did we do? Why my presentation, why the title of my presentation is Hacking the Zero Day Market? Uh, we need to normalize and streamline a business which is not even recognized as a, a official business. I mean, come on, when you want to buy uh, personal firearms for your police forces, you go to Beretta or you go to another big firearms maker. And as a government, you, you buy from them. When you want, when you want to buy a iOS chain, which can be used to go after the worst terrorists in the world and maybe avoid a horrible, uh, terrorist attack somewhere, like recently in Sri Lanka, then apparently <laughs> the people you have to talk with are criminals or close to being criminals. This is, uh, nowadays it, it has become impossible, you see. You see, uh, um, of course, there's a huge risk of abuses when the market is shady and underground and gray and not transparent. So, to make a long story short, we're trying to streamline this business by doing the following things. Protect and pay researchers more. By protecting, I mean signing proper contracts with these people with clauses which are fair for both sides uh, and pay more <coughs> when, of course, they deserve it. Reduce all the unnecessary middlemen which are, which are a plague in this field. There's a lot of people who is in this field only because they have the right connections. They are not adding any value. And... Basically, they are stealing from the researchers. <laughs> and so, while some middlemen can be useful, so the, the, the aim of, of this pillar of our action is to um, help the right brokers which give an added value and cut off the, the brokers we are just parasites. Then we need to dedicate more economic resources. This is not a game anymore. Governments are not in a testing or experimenting phase anymore. This is the real thing. There are huge units uh, within these agencies which rely exclusively on these kind of tools to perform their activities and reach their goals. So this is not... Uh, 2003 anymore, hmm? but many people still would like to believe that we are still in 2003, but we aren't. And of course, we need to develop and adopt best practices because there are none, which is bad for any business. And so it's also bad for this business. So what did we do practically in the past year, basically, because Crossfence was founded in 2017 after one year of studying and talking with lawyers, researchers, agencies, and so on. Uh, but the company went public in, in almost one year ago, in April 2018. So, well, first thing we did was to launch the largest bug bounty program in history. So uh, the budget for last year bug bounty program that we offered was ten million dollars, and I'm proud to say that in the end we managed to to spend the whole budget. And uh, 
And then in September, we, after working very hard on that thing, we launched the Vulnerability Research Hub, which we call VRH. We'll talk about it in a couple of slides. <clears throat> so these are the two first steps. I can anticipate that we will add to the VRH a new uh, training area, which will offer free training, very high level free training, tutorials, uh, and a firing range for people to experiment and test and learn. This is going to happen within this year. We are partnering with very, very uh, cool uh, companies around the world and researchers to achieve this and to build this new area within the VRH. Uh, another thing that I can anticipate, because it's written here on, on some posters, is that in November, <coughs> there will be in Abu Dhabi the first um, Pontuon-like contest. And we are putting, uh, I think, $1.5 million of prices for this, OK? So, and another thing that I forgot to mention is that to normalize this business, this business, we are putting our face on what we're doing. We're going to events, we're talking to people, we are uh, talking about what we're doing. So, <clears throat> let's have a quick look at the, at the Back Bounty program. It helped us to purchase top quality capabilities. I was really amazed about the quality of the assets that we were offered last year. Considering that the security, uh, at least the main vendors of, for example, mobile phones, in the past three, four years, began to, to work seriously on security issues. Uh, before that time, it was more security theater, in my opinion. But in the past three, four years, they started to really work uh, on, on this stuff and with great results. So finding something valuable for uh, Android or uh, iOS phone nowadays is probably 50 times harder than it was three years ago. Okay, and it's an exponential trend. So, by the way, I foresee that in two, three years, this market for mobile phones will be almost finished. But we will deal with different targets by, by then. So, in 2019, we added more bounties because we added more categories of uh, families of targets. So, we also added... Um, routers, Wi-Fi, and baseband uh, chipsets, and um, instant messengers of all kind. The other categories are, of course, Windows, and especially <coughs> browser-based uh, assets, Mac OS, same, iOS, same, or zero interaction. Uh, assets which are like uh, the holy grail <laughs> in this field, so difficult to, to find. And of course, Android as well. So what is the Vulnerability Research Hub? It's um, basically, it sounds very bad. <laughs> it's a web application. <laughs> so everyone at this point is very scared, I know. But it's a very different web application. I'm not saying it won't be hacked. It probably will. But it's built in a very, very funny way. Therefore, I think we did something that shouldn't be done with web-based technology with the VRH. So it's end-to-end -end encrypted, and it works in a very interesting way so that even if you manage to hack it, you probably won't achieve any advantage by doing that. So anyway, um, but what's inside the VRH? It's a very, very simple interface that is used for 
by researchers to uh, submit their uh, their research and talk with us in a safe way in a priv- private environment uh, and then as the discussion moves forward to evaluate from a techno- te- te- technological point of view their findings uh, negotiating contracting and and then for also for payment they can submit their findings uh, as in scope with our bug bounty program and there is a dedicated section for that or they can freely submit some other kind of research within our code of conduit this means that if you want to submit a, a hack for a nuclear power plant we will not accept it if you want to submit a hack for a wearable health device it will be bounced back if you're trying to sell us stolen documents records or plans for the death star it would be rejected and so on and so on and so on we have a very strict approach to this because as you can imagine being public uh, for us uh, uh, avoiding liabilities is extremely important right and and we don't need that kind of stuff actually so we receive let's say that uh, uh, in 100 submissions it's like a big funnel in 100 submissions we end up uh, evaluating probably six or seven assets everything else is either too out of scope crazy or um, or not interesting right <clears throat> And now I will show you something that nobody saw before outside CrowdFence. And this is the stats of the assets that we handled in the first quarter of 2019, divided by category. Very high level uh, classification, of course. So it's interesting. This is um, uh, on on the on on your right. You see the number of uh, assets that were handled by month, and you see that researchers party a lot during Christmas holidays, and then they're like uh, you know diesel uh, engines. So they start to wake up in between February and March, and then the the year begins. Um, and on your left, <laughs> you will see a very rough um, clusterization of what we uh, handled. Uh, web apps, Windows, Android, and Apple products, macOS and iOS, you should... Well, they are separated, but in fact, it would be... Uh, it would be better to to sum these two amounts so it's uh, 16 percent and then other stuff when you see multi it means that this kind of bug can be used in different operating systems the same bug Hmm? so well there are a couple of funny things here first of all there's small there's more apple rated stuff than android rated stuff and the reason is that android is such a messy ecosystem that to find something that works, uh, uh, that which is generic enough to work on more than one specific model or one specific brand, it's hard. Uh, then, of course, Windows is the biggest slice of this pie. Um, well, mainly because more people are working on, on, on Windows than on anything else. Um, so when you sign up to the VRH, you would see something like this. Okay. So it's a very simple, plain, uh, interface, which is more or less, uh, something in between, uh, a ticketing system and, uh, 
uh, a private forum where you have one-to-one -one conversations on certain topics. There are statuses, everything is managed and tracked uh, in a, in a, I would say, let me say, in a professional way, okay? Uh, instead of sending messages on WhatsApp, hey man, how you doing? I have a, a RC for a, a Safari, which is bad, okay? Don't send me RCs for Safari on WhatsApp, ever. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> but through the VRH, yes, please. Um, there is also a chat which is generated with each submission, so it's a kind of a dedicated encrypted chat with keys generated for that specific submission. And um, and through that chat, we can exchange documents, screenshots, logs, uh, whatever it takes for the technical evaluation without seeing the code. Because, of course, we will see the code only after the whole process of being performed and we are ready to buy. Which is good for researchers, of course, because they don't want to to lose control over their own code. It's totally reasonable. So what are the, the, the end results? After it was launched in September, as I said, so it's now eight months. Well, first of all, faster time to market, which is important if you remember what we, what we said at the beginning. These goods have a shelf life of three months, four months. So if you spend two months and a half negotiating, <laughs> the, the remaining shelf life is 15 days, which is bad. And, and also customers on average will receive higher quality products because of all the work that we put into analyzing, reviewing, documenting, and testing these uh, capabilities. So, to join is really easy. You will see that you need to supply an uh, email and a public PGP key, which the platform will use to send you notifications without saying anything, just there's a new status or a new message. And, uh, and then the application will generate a cup like ProtonMail, for example, a couple of of keys for you and you will input a hopefully very long passphrase to protect the private key and then you will be in the in the platform. Uh, I think that's that's all. Uh, I'm I'm done unless you have questions which I'll be glad to, to answer. If you want to have a look at our website, you can find it at crowdfence.com and uh, VRH is at vrhcrowdfence.com. Uh, any questions? Insults? <laughs> All right. So, thank you so much for uh, coming. I wish you to uh, have a very good time here at Hexpo. Enjoy these fantastic talks which will follow in an, and hope to see you around the next two days. Thank you so much again. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.